Uh, my name is Anthony Camilleri. Um, uh, currently, I'm a senior director of the Knowledge Innovation Center, which is a small educational consultancy specializing in quality assurance and online distance learning. And we have offices here in Slovenia as well as in Malta. Um, before this, I was quality services manager for the European Foundation for Quality and e-learning. And before that, I was a member of the European Students' Union. And well, before that, I was a student. <laughs> um, in the last uh, four or five years, I've been running a number of EU-funded projects uh, looking specifically at quality issues linked to open, flexible higher education. We've been having projects that are looking at what the quality criteria for open education are, quality methodologies for it. We've been looking at how to deal with the whole set of issues around certification and recognition and credentialization. We've, so it's a fair amount of activities, all looking at, let's say, trying to set up the service infrastructure for quality assurance of uh, flexible higher education. Arco already talked about definitions of open education and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to repeat the definition of open education. But one of the interesting things, if we're looking at the definition of OER, is not only the bit people agree on, but the bit people disagree on. And uh, the Institute of Prospective Technological Studies in Seville had actually published a study on quality of open education and did a comparison of about 20 different definitions offered by all the international organizations. And what they had said was that the elements which are in every definition are that it has to be published under a license that allows for use and reuse and so on, and that encom encompasses all types of digital media. But then there are a number of bullets which, depending on whose definition you use, it varies. First of all, some people say OER is exclusively digital resources. The other definitions say it can be any type of educational resource. Some people say that the resource has to be produced explicitly with an educational aim, while other people say, listen, any resource that can be used for education, whether it was produced for education or not, can be considered an OER. And the final one is on the type of license. Some people say, listen, unless it's publicly available to anybody in the whole world, it isn't an OER. While under other definitions, if you publish it exclusively for educational purposes, it will be considered an OER. And generally, when we're talking about OER, we're talking about the ones that match this definition and taking into account all the variation of the ones which are disagreed upon. What is then open education as a whole? And all of you started badgering Darko very much earlier about does it include this and does it include this and does it include the other? And you bring me very nicely to this matrix. Now this actually comes from the University of Cape Town, but it's still one of the best matrices I've found to explain the entire breadth of open education. Because if we think of open education as a whole, then we're talking about a lot more than just open licensing. We're talking about social openness, which basically means how open is your pedagogy from something that's very lecturer-centered to something that's very, very participative. We're talking about technical openness of the platform. Are you using open source software or proprietary software? Of course, we're talking about the license openness. And we're also talking about the financial openness. Now, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, this is not a quality matrix. We are not saying that you have to be up here at the top on everything to be a quality education. This is rather a menu of choices you have when you're trying to decide how open and is appropriate for your institution in your particular context. MOOCs we've talked about a lot and the only thing I'm going to add to what Darko was saying is MOOCs are something extremely specific. They have to be massive with theoretically no limit to students. They have to be open, they have to be online, and they have to be structured as courses. Now, especially on the massive part of it, a lot of things which are called MOOCs fail. And I don't have any statistic on this, but my personal guess would be about 80% of courses that call themselves MOOCs probably are not. 
they're just plain old normal distance learning that has been relabeled MOOC because the term is cool at the moment. And unfortunately, that is causing a lot of confusion. MOOCs are something very, very specific. And over here I said, don't miss the forest for the trees. The reason MOOCs are getting so much attention is because they bring together a lot of different technological trends in education. They match them with a set of social trends that are going on. And let's say they've produced, if you will, a golden moment, which is enabling change in other areas. And talking about that, this is a history of technology of the world and how it grows with population. And the thing you see all the way there on the graph is that in the last hundred years, the rate of technological expansion has gone up beyond exponentially. It just goes up quickly, 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 quickly. And to a large extent, MOOCs are a symptom of all these changes. They're by far not the final result of those changes. The technological trends which we talk about at the moment, and this is the result of an FP7 project that was actually looking specifically into what technological trends will be affected by education in the next 10 years or so. And here are six of the trends that we think are changing education now in a big way and that we're going to, will continue to change education very much in the next years. And then, by extension, which we're going to have to figure out the quality assurance for in the next years. First of all, ubiquitous computing. Very simply, we now have access to computing power anytime, anywhere, and thanks to the cloud in unlimited quantities. Remember that when, you have, when you're holding a mobile phone, you're not just holding a mobile phone and the power of that mobile phone. You have a Google data center or an Apple data center or a Microsoft data center backing that up with the entire power of a data center, and you're holding that power in your hand. Together with ubiquitous computing, we are also moving into a world of open data, which we've talked about a lot and it's coming. So not only do we have the computing power in our hands, we are also coming very close and very quickly to a point where you're going to have the entire sum of the knowledge of humanity available to you on demand at any time. And quite probably, you'll even be able to just ask your phone by voice and get an answer. Imagine what that means for every curriculum of every subject taught. When you say, listen, information is cheap, information doesn't need to be memorized, information can just be asked for and I get it. How do you refocus education? How do you take that into account? And that is a massive question which we're only just beginning to deal with. Then we have learning analytics. Now, pedagogy so far has always been very, very experience-based. For the first time, and especially when you pair it with things like MOOCs, we have the ability to base it on concrete data. If you have a course with 10,000 students running the course, it means you can run experiments, you can run tests, things like A-B testing. What if I change this figure for a slightly better figure? Let's send it to 500 different students each and see if there's a difference in the results. You can create these sort of tests and hundreds of different other ones. Learning analytics can give us fine information on what really works in teaching with data. And I mean, this is revolutionizing the social sciences as a whole, but also education. Semantic search, I've always already referred to it a little bit. Simply enough, it's the ability to talk and converse with machines. Again, think about machines that can answer questions. I am not going to dare predict how complicated questions there are, but a lot of things on a social studies homework in grade school can already be answered. Collaboration technologies, these have been around for a while, but they keep getting more powerful day after day. And one of the things I do, I do a number of QA reviews of universities. And even five years ago, the main way of contacting students was still student hours in an office. Nowadays, teachers are communicating on Facebook, on Skype, by email, LinkedIn. Every type of communication means uh, available with students all over the world at all times of the day and night. And next range of technologies, we're now beginning to talk about virtual reality becoming a real thing. I mean, within the next year, three different companies will launch VR helmets. 
Imagine that for simulation of surgery, imagine that for engineering, imagine that for any number of subjects. And again, this isn't 20 years in the future technology. These are things going on the market this year. Universities are already developing the applications to go into them. You will see them on the market early next year. And finally, personalization technologies. And this one is maybe the widest, but also the most exciting. For the last hundred years or so, our aim has been to put more and more and more people into higher education. The way we've done it is by stuffing more and more people into the classroom, receiving exactly the same lecture again and again. And that is beginning to reach its limit. A lot of people would say it's already unsustainable. Universities are overburdened, budgets are shrinking, and we need to find a better way. And personalization technologies are saying, how can we customize the education experience so each student actually gets something that is suited to their particular learning style? Imagine languages. Some people learn visually, some people learn through audio, some people learn through writing. And imagine that you could match the learning style particularly to each student so they can learn in the most efficient, fastest way possible. If you have humans doing it, it's just not actually, it's just not sustainable, it's too expensive. But imagine today's teachers supported by a whole range of artificial intelligence technologies to actually do this. So these are the technology trends which we are looking at right now in terms of changing education. We're also, though, looking at a number of social trends. And very much these are the ones that are being driven by the financial crisis. Governments every day are putting more and more and more demands onto higher education. They're being asked to provide graduates to supply the knowledge economy. They're being told they have to be more efficient. We had the director of NACVIS a little while ago talking about institutions need to merge to be more efficient. They're being asked to extend the reach of programs and create programs for all sorts of new professions. And they have to continually update content. And that content updating is happening at a faster and faster and faster pace. In short, governments are giving institutions one mission. We want you to do more, we want you to do it better, and we want you to do it with less money. Which is hard. Let's put it that way. And then, we have a number of trends in open and flexible higher education. And I'll be taking you through each of these in detail and seeing also what it means for quality assurance. We're seeing a growing role of OER. We're seeing universities collaborate together more to keep up with changes in technology, opening up Slovenia being one of the examples of such collaborations. We're seeing an emergence of non-traditional providers in higher education. We're seeing a phenomenon called unbundling, and we are having increasing demand for new types of recognition and portability of qualifications. So, let's get started on the growing role of open educational resources. There are a lot more than most people think. According to Repository 66, which basically collects data on how many learning objects are in learning repositories, there were 3,000 and 45 learning repositories globally in 2014, April 2014. That was a 7% growth over the year before. 12 million learning objects. That means that, if my math is right, more or less 1 million learning objects are being added per year into global repositories. It's a massive rate of growth. And by the way, with open access mandates being introduced in more and more countries, that rate is not going to slow down, it's actually going to accelerate in the next years. So the QA issues we have to consider if we think about this amazing variety of learning objects are out there. First of all, how can we actually incentivize teachers to use these learning resources? There's 12 million learning objects in the databases, but when you actually look at how many of them are being reused or repurposed or reshared, it's very, very, very few. One of the reasons, if you as a teacher publish the material, do you get any credit for it? Do you get any job performance related for it? If you publish research and that research is cited and that research is cited by another person, you might get a promotion. But if it's reused, if your teaching material is reused by another teacher, probably nobody will care. 
maybe if it's reused by 100 teachers, you might get a bit of a certificate at the end if your institution even tracks these things. So one of the things we have to look at on quality assurance, we have to start looking at how can we incorporate reuse into the concept of quality assurance of teaching. And then and one of the really interesting ones, how do open resources affect concepts of efficiency? So at the moment, most curricula are, de are developed in silos. They're developed in closed systems where there are 100 universities in Europe all offering the same Sociology 101 class or the same Introduction to Marx class. Maybe there's 10 different ways of doing it, but there definitely isn't 100 ways of doing Introduction to Marx. What happens when all of this becomes open and you can say, you know what, look, Three universities financed by the same government are basically producing the same course. What if we bring them together and what if we try and make it more efficient by using the open licensing to actually consolidate the creation of content? And how do you actually incorporate a requirement for these sort of efficiencies into quality assurance systems? Another of the questions we're just beginning to tackle. The next thing I said we'd talk about is unbundling of higher education. First of all, what do we mean by a bundled higher education? And the bundle of higher education is saying that higher education is a set of services, a set of very different services that have essentially been packaged together. We have four types. First of all, we have what we call the content loop. That's content authoring and production. It's content transfer. It's giving content over to students through transfer. Secondly, it has a job of giving people access to you opportunities. So a university degree, quite simply, is the passport to employment. It provides a certain mapping of your skills. It gives you a certain mapping to an alumni network. And it has a function there of just providing your passport towards the next phase in life. It has a function of skill training, of providing you with specific skills and specific attitudes which are useful within specific contexts. And finally, it has a role as a transformative experience. Or the only way to put it is, when you go to university, you're not supposed to just learn content, you're not supposed to just learn skills, but you're supposed to graduate as an educated person, a person with a certain viewpoint on life, a certain type of critical thinking. And this bundle of services is all offered at the moment in one set. Today, though, we are seeing more and more that certain functions of universities are being unbundled. This graph comes from a project called OER Test, where we brought together university management from a number of different countries, and we started looking at what type of unbundling exists at the moment, what is most likely to move forward. Do we have scenarios where you might have one university producing content, another university actually doing the teaching, maybe a third one doing the certification, maybe a fourth one actually awarding a different type of degree based on the certification created by a third. And there's a whole different matrix of options. But the most popular ones we came up with that are linked to OER were three. First of all, we said there's a possibility for what we call traditional OER. And traditional OER is probably the simplest model a university does everything it does normally, except that it puts all its course as it's going online for its own students. MIT OpenCourseWare, for example, is very close to this uh, traditional OER model. The second thing we thought of as a scenario for the future is something we call OER Erasmus. OER Erasmus works a lot like Erasmus today, in the sense that a university would say, Let's sign contracts with four or five other universities who we trust and we like the open educational resources or the MOOCs coming out of these universities and we're going to add them to our course catalogue. So you could say, listen, we don't offer this a credit in this particular speciality, but if you take the MOOC from the University of Edinburgh, which we recognise as a quality one, and they give you an exam, we'll recognise it as part of the course here in Slovenia, for example. And this was one of the th scenarios which university leaders thought would become very likely in the next years. The third one is very, very similar. We called it OER Summer School. And the reason we called it OER Summer School is because it basically works the way summer schools work in a lot of universities today. 
When you go to a summer school, you don't ask your university for permission to go to the summer school. I just see a summer school online being offered, I don't know, in Copenhagen. I go, I take it, they'll give me ATCTS. I come back and I ask my university to recognize those ATCTS and say, would you add it to my course? Depending on how the course is structured, with optional credits, with transfer credit and so on, they may decide to accept it if it's relevant, or they might say, sorry, it's not relevant, we won't. Now remember, several of the MOOCs being offered in Europe now offer ECTS. Darko probably knows the exact number, but uh, it's well over 150 MOOCs now of, uh, offering ECTS the last time I counted. And uh, that means, because they're ECTS, those students right now can come to your institution and ask for that to be recognized for credit. And that's what we call the OER summer school model. And you already see this unbundling happening in practice. So there are a number of quality assurance issues linked to unbundling. On the good side, it increases student choice. Simply enough, you're no longer limited to the choice of credit at your own institution. But say, just within the European context, you have another, another thousand courses you can subscribe to and say, I want to take one of these instead. Secondly, it allows for increased specialization in functions of higher education. Because you have all these open education courses around, it means that a university might be able to get enough capacity for a very niche subject, which it wouldn't be able to get just from physical students in its own location. And it stimulates innovation and it stimulates quality just through the competition of everybody's materials being online and people being able to openly compare what credits are being offered by different people. Till now, the only way to compare courses was to actually go and sit in a classroom and do it at 15 different universities. In my example on introductory marks, you can now like test drive the first lesson of 10 different ones easily online in a world with more MOOCs. On the minor side of it though, if we think of MOOCs as courses, and I put a focus on courses rather than on programs, when we think of a program, a program is more than just a collection of courses. There are also those, all those implicit functions of higher education, which you need the whole experience for, and not just 15 random courses put together from different universities. And that's one of the things which we have to figure out how to deal with. Secondly, it's linked to it, is the whole of higher education qualification more than it, the sum of its parts? I don't have a good answer to these questions, just to be clear. But when we're looking at quality assurance, for example, Excelsior College in the US will now accept 96% transfer credit. This is an accredited university. So you can come in with 96% of your credit earned from anywhere. MOOCs, a half a course at this university, a summer school somewhere else, etc. You do the last 4% of credits at Excelsior, they give you a degree. To my knowledge, there isn't a university in Europe doing this yet. But I mean, there's already about seven or eight institutions in the US doing it. It's only a matter of time before somebody starts doing this in Europe. And at least through my reading of the Bologna documents and so on, there's absolutely nothing to stop them. Now again, you can argue that this is a good thing or a bad thing. All I'm saying is that for, in quality assurance terms, nobody's really thought about it yet and decided if it's a good thing or not. Apart from unbundling of education, also means that you have different types of providers coming to offer different parts of the bundles. And we have all sorts of new companies that are entering the education sphere. First of all, on the left, we have what I call hybrid providers. And this is by far the biggest segment of the market. These are mergers of higher education institutions and technology companies that work together to actually give educational services. If you think, for example, of Coursera, Coursera basically provides a technology platform and a methodology for creating MOOCs. And it works in collaboration with universities that give you those MOOCs. However, when you get the degree, when you get the certificate, it doesn't say University of X, it says University of X and Coursera. The whole thing is offered together as a hybrid service. 
On the right hand side then, we have a number of other types of companies that are new entrants in the field. First of all, teaching and examination centers. These are basically centers that either offer teaching based on somebody else's content, you see a lot of franchise operations working on this, or who just specialize in examinations. This has, this has existed for a number of years, but in the last five years or so, the number of them has grown exponentially. And I mean, it's now a business uh, worth nearly a billion dollars globally. So it's really growing very, very quickly. Secondly, we have the RPL universities. These universities that specialize in transfer credits, just like the example of Excelsior I just gave you. And they're institutions which basically say, listen, we'll recognize whatever you give us, and we'll give you the last little bit you need to turn it into a degree. And again, they're quite specialist institutions. Thirdly, we have exam-only companies. In Europe, these are just starting, but there's a European directive on recognition of prior learning, which basically is moving forward the creation of these companies. And what these companies do is you come in and say, I have X knowledge, and they will design an exam for you and give you a recognized qualification based on your informal knowledge. If you think of the potential of that with something like MOOCs, suddenly you see how MOOCs can turn into real qualifications through the intervention of companies like this. And fourthly, you have publishers. Now publishers don't produce just books anymore. Open education is happening, open publishing is happening, and their business model is basically being eaten away. So now, most textbooks are coming with online learning communities, with tutorials, with videos, with entire online sites, which means that the publishers effectively are getting into the teaching business and not just the publishing business. So this is an entirely different business environment to what we would have seen in 10 years ago, where this slide basically would have read universities, companies owned by the universities, and that's about it. Now here's the thing, from a quality perspective, None of these are explicitly regulated by QA systems. We've spent not years, but decades building up a detailed quality assurance system for what happens in a full higher education institution. But if you only take part of the functions of a higher education institution, usually that means that you can avoid the quality assurance system as a whole. Or you might find that they tell you, sorry, you can't do it. So if you are an excellent training college, an excellent, let's say, offering IT courses, and you want to offer ECTS to your students, and you are just as good at the university, you can't. Because only higher education institutions are allowed to give ECTS. And you have to be a university. Now that one, by the way, in the next version of the ECTS guide, due out, I think, the end of this year, they're actually going to allow countries to show some flexibility, and each country will have to make a decision Will they let institutions other than universities offer ECTS? And that one, again, is going to be a major market expansion. So the challenge for the quality systems, we do need to protect students. We do need regulation. But we also need to enable innovation. I mean, all these actors, all these small actors are innovating education. They're making it more efficient. And we can't block them through regulation. So the challenge for quality assurance is really to find the right balance. And I know somebody had asked this question this morning about do we need to regulate them? We do need to regulate them because there are a lot of bad actors in the field. Unfortunately, one of the bad things about online education is anybody with uh, five web developers and a half-decent content guy in a basement can put up a website that looks like it comes from a professional university. It's really easy to fake these. And not only do we have fake institutions, we now have fake university networks we have fake accreditation agencies. We even have fake global networks of accreditation agencies. Some of them are officially linked to UNESCO because they bribe some official in, uh, I'm going to say somewhere in Africa, get a UNESCO chair who doesn't know what they're doing and they officially have the UNESCO logo on them. These things are sophisticated operations. So we do need some type of regulation because unless you're an expert in higher education, you're not going to figure it out. So, the answer to that question is yes, regulation, but we have to keep it as light touch as possible and also enable the innovation in the field. The next trend I was talking about is that because innovation is happening so fast, 
universities have realized that they basically can't catch up with it on their own. So especially with regards to MOOCs and online education, universities have started banding together into groups to face the challenge together and share resources. And there are a number of different models which are being applied. First of all, you have university networks who have decided to publish courses under a single brand. Example of this, the Open Up Ed Consortium. All their courses are being published under the Open Up Ed brand, made available on one website. You also have edX, where you have a number of universities come together, they form the consortium that is jointly owned by all the universities, and they publish courses under the edX brand. The second type, is university business collaborations for the provision of education. Where rather than you have a university forming a network of just universities, you have universities and companies creating a joint provision structure. And that's the example of Coursera is the number one on it. And then the third one, you have this model, which is being very much pioneered in Slovenia. You have what I call living labs to develop content, technology and pedagogy and you come together on a national platform. France is something similar, but not, as why, not in all three areas. And this is another model of bringing all the actors together to innovate faster. The interesting thing from a quality perspective is that either deliberately or by accident, they are creating quality labels for MOOCs. edX and Coursera, they don't publish them, but they have quality criteria to let in institutions. What they put on their website is we only let in world-class institutions. Their definition of world-class is classified, but I mean, it's pretty clear that they're rather exclusive in terms of who they let in and who they don't. Open Up Ed, to join Open Up Ed, there is a specific set of requirements on a quality label to join that consortium. It's very interesting, but I'm not gonna say more about it because Darko has a presentation on it in 20 minutes or so. Finally, we have an increased demand for recognition. Now here's the thing, more and more students are doing MOOCs, are doing online learning, are doing various types of education. And no matter what some providers claim, students want recognition. They want a piece of paper that's actually worth something. Here's a set of different types of recognition tools. At the lowest level, you have learning badges, which are just sort of like these little stars on your copy book you get for completing particular tasks. You have certificates of attendance, certificates of completion. Within that, some providers now will give you a verified certificate of attendance or a verified certificate of completion. Then you have ECTS, which we all know very well in Europe, and you have diplomas and degrees. Now, essentially, the legal tool that makes qualifications official is a qualification framework. And pretty much every country in Europe has created a formal qualification framework. The thing is, only ECTS and diplomas map easily to the qualification framework. These three above, they don't really map well to it. You can try and map it, but there's not even a requirement to map them because when we designed qualification frameworks, nobody had ever heard of these things. So, on the one hand, Student expects higher education to provide portable and recognizable qualifications. That's the default expectation from students. If they're getting just a certificate of completion, you have to explain to them that this really isn't worth much. And you'll have to explain it to them two or three times. Because, I mean, universities, what they do is they give you qualifications that are good for the labor market. That's what they do. The idea of giving qualification that isn't take some explaining to somebody who isn't in the business. So the challenge for quality assurance systems is first of all, we need to find ways to ensure equivalent quality across all qualification types. There's nothing necessarily wrong about giving a certificate of completion. But the other thing is, as soon as you call it a certificate of completion, you don't have to go through a quality assurance evaluation. In Slovenia, NACFIS, has to do programs that do degrees. MOOCs don't fall under the quality assurance framework at all, which means an unscrupulous provider could pretty much do whatever they wanted here. The other thing though, is that as a criteria of quality, 
we also start, need to start introducing the idea of quality of qualifications. So far, we always talked about quality of teaching, quality of the environment, uh, quality of various things, but we never needed to talk about quality of the qualification. These qualifications all had the same value. But we're moving into a world where we have qualifications of different values. Some have real value on the labor market and in society, some have less value. And if you think of the quality of the educational experience as a whole, then you very quickly see that these qualifications become an element of quality and their value become an element of quality. Finally, open data and quality. So, all the trends are not just changing what we look at in quality, but they're also changing how we do quality. And open data, to a large extent, has the potential to change a lot. And if you look at different areas of industry, different areas of action, surprisingly, even though ed higher education basically invented most of this stuff, in terms of applying it, it's one, it's one of the industries that is the most behind in applying a lot of these principles. We have a challenge to assure minimum quality standards. This, over the last 10 years, we've managed to do across Europe with the introduction of quality assurance agencies in each country. Secondly, we now have a challenge to give access to data. Think about this for a moment. If I go online now, I can find a village anywhere in Asia, on some island you've never heard of, and I can find out the exact quality of any hotel room in that town, easily, in seconds. If I want to know how good a lecture is in a 500 student classroom at the University of Ljubljana, there's no source for it, or for any other university in the world. The irony is, we have all this data. All those student questionnaires, all those teacher questionnaires, all those quality assurance reports being archived in God knows which silo and never being read by anybody. You create a standard you say, these can be read by computers. And then you let startups process the data. You let startups say, we're going to mash it and create a teacher ranking. We're going to mash it and say, what are the 10 most attended classes in Slovenia? We're going to mash it and create services we can't even imagine. This is the potential of open data. And then other ones will start comparing countries and other ones will start comparing the world. And suddenly, what you see in hotels.com for hotels, we'll have for classes. And imagine what that does then for quality, when suddenly you become comparable with other institutions. We also have a challenge to offer various ranking methodologies. One of the problems we have generally in higher education is that we have two or three big global rankings. They have a certain perspective of quality, and because those are the most famous, everybody is going up to their view of quality. And whether you like it or not, they are basically becoming the most influential players in global higher education. Think about this. The people who determine quality in higher education today are not the leaders of the biggest universities. They're a room full of 15 data scientists at Thomson Reuters. They decide what quality is today. And every university has like special leadership positions dedicated to reaching that vision of quality. If we open up the data, it means that then we can build any ranking methodology we like. Anybody can build a ranking methodology with very little effort. The only reason Thomson Reuters are the ones leading this is because they're the only organization that has the capacity to do the surveying of the universities. The only reason they're in that position is because the data is closed, so they have to do their own data collection. So imagine if we open it up. And then the last part of the picture, we need to allow for user review and user rating. And I mean, this is completely for the private sector. This is an area where we need areas where people can really start comparing the qualities and comparing their experiences. There are a number of interesting websites that actually do this already, some across Europe, some for particular countries, but so far none of them have really reached the critical mass that you could say they are the authority in the field. But the point is, open data will bring an entirely new level of transparency and an entirely new level of uh, tools to higher education as a whole. First of all, open publishing offers significant opportunities for Slovene education. Put simply, you have an enormous amount of material in the education system 
which actually is not published. A lot of textbooks are informal. You all know of this. The set of notes that gets updated every year is put in the photocopy shop and is taught on on the basis. And because Slovenia is a small country, it hasn't necessarily ever been turned into a formal textbook with a publishing house, but quite often is the definitive resource on the field. Imagine that same material moved to an online wiki, giving a digital object identifier number so that it's published and an ISBN, updated with suggestions from students and from other professors around the country each year, and becoming the definitive textbook in the field for the country. Also think about incentives for teachers in creating this content. If you did something like this, you would do quite a service to the country because it means that people in all the other universities could use that material or you're contributing to updating material that was created at another university. Imagine if you created incentives for teachers to actually work together like this and say, listen, let's stop creating the same materials. We're all going to do our own variety on it, but let's create a master version and each one customize from that master version and do it openly as a community of teachers. But why would you do it if you don't get any incentives for all this work? Publishing is hard. So that's one open issue. Secondly, unbundling enables student choice. Now again, this comes back to Slovenia is a small country. You can't possibly offer every specialization every course that is out there. It would be impossible, it would be horribly inefficient. Imagine what I was talking about before, about OER Erasmus, for example. Imagine as part of a course on sustainable development, saying, a, part of a program on sustainable development, saying, ah, there's this course from the University of Maastricht offered as a MOOC. We can't offer this here because there's, there's not enough student demand for it, but if a student chooses this, we will recognize the credit as part of the program. And we will put it on our course catalog, so students have the option and know that it will be included. One or two universities have started experimenting with these models across Europe, but it's a very interesting idea for extending it in very specific areas where you can't necessarily cover niche subjects. On the other hand, Slovenia also can export this. If you want to learn Slovene in most universities abroad, not very possible, even if you're a language student really wanting to learn about it. Imagine saying, listen, we're going to create a gold-plated MOOC with proper accreditation, offer ECTS, and then work with some language departments abroad to actually offer it to their students. So if you think of MOOCs as an instrument to enable student choice, there's really a lot of scope of ideas you can work on. Issue three. This one's to the people in the ministry. Quite simply, and by the way, this slide is the same in whichever country in Europe you go to, the legislative framework hasn't really thought about non-traditional higher education providers. They're coming quickly, we need to think about it. A lot of the European associations, by the way, are making the same recommendation to the European Commission and to UNESCO and to various other bodies that non-traditional higher education needs to be thought about in terms of a broader context. Fourthly, Open learning certification is creating confusion. All those certificates of completion, all those certificates of attendance, verified, non-verified, signature tracks, how on earth can anybody keep track of them? And the people this is hurting, students may be benefiting from more educational possibilities than ever. They're also, through nobody's fault, getting tricked many times. Some of the ideas to think about, what about just publishing a user's guide to MOOC certification, saying these are the qualifications accepted in Slovenia, these are the ones which are not. For example, some countries are thinking of doing this, some countries are saying if a university offers qualification, it has to offer ECTS. Full stop. You are universities, you do a certain grade of education, certificate of completion are not enough. It's an idea being considered by some. Again, you could argue that, listen, you open up education more if you don't do it, so I'm not necessarily recommending for it. I'm just saying that it's an issue being considered in a lot of places. Issue five, and this is the hard one. There is currently no realistic path towards MOOC recognition. So if I get a first class, a gold-plated MOOC from the US, in Europe, it's easier, because if it has ECTS, there's some sort of recognition pathway. 
But unless it doesn't have ECTS on it, if I do the MOOC and say, please recognize this, there isn't really a pathway to do it. Now, there's two essential pathways you can choose to take to actually enable MOOC recognition. First one is RPL. So you just say, listen, this is going to be considered recognition of prior learning, push it into a recognition of prior learning pathway, done. The problem is, you saw the numbers, millions of students taking MOOCs. Let's give it another three or four years of development. Recognition of prior learning pathways are expensive, they're time consuming, and if you suddenly, if this grows as some people think it will, and you start getting hundreds of requests, the system will collapse under its own weight very, very quickly. So another interesting idea is creating a trusted list for MOOCs. For example, Open Up Ed, they have a set of quality standards which say you have to apply the same quality system to MOOCs as you do to every other program. You have to offer ECTS, you have to do this. And you say, you know what? As a country, we trust these two or three quality labels. Or you can even do it at an institutional level. University of Edinburgh, Universidad Oberta de Catalunya, these produce good MOOCs which are in line with our quality system. So MOOCs from these providers or these networks or these universities are automatically recognized. We'll accept their credit because we trust their quality system. And then you shortcut the RPL pathway. It's a complicated issue, but one which we're going to be start thinking about more and more. And the last issue, and I'm saying this as fact, automated teaching is in many cases more efficient. Again, I'm not saying often, I'm not saying always, but in many cases, automated teaching, just plain, is more efficient. Especially if you think of ex cathedra lectures. Online is better, and I have no problem saying that. What does that mean, though, from a strategy perspective? Because we've known it's better for quite a while, but uptake is low. First of all, an idea is integrating mode of provision into quality assurance criteria. So right now, quality assurance criteria in most countries say, okay, if you have online learning, these are the criteria. If you have blended learning, these are the criteria. If you have face-to-face -face learning, these are the criteria. And a lot of systems also have efficiency benchmarks for all those three. Systems are not, however, asking you, have you thought about whether to provide this as blended, online, or face-to-face, -face, and which one is most efficient, and which one is most appropriate for your target group. If we start asking institutions to, through quality assurance criteria, to make an educated decision on the mode of provision, I think we would see a different set of choices. I think we would see institutions choosing other pathways than necessarily the default ones. Secondly, and this again goes for most countries, we may be teaching, stud uh, we may be teaching, teaching students today something about new technologies. But we have a massive set of people who are already in higher education, who are already teaching, that need to be educated, that need to be introduced to these new pedagogies, that need support. And I mean, this again goes for pretty much every country in Europe, although some of them have it. You need a national excellent centre for e-learning, whose job is to support teachers in learning design, to push seminars, etc. At the moment, from the checks I did in Slovenia, these things happen, but they're on a very ad hoc basis. A faculty decides to organize a two-day training, and so on and so forth. You need something much more proactive that will uh, and target to train X percentage of teachers in online methodologies by X year, if you want to move, if you want to take a quantum leap forward. And lastly, and I know this is always controversial, but it might be interesting to reserve certain funds for MOOC creation. We know that MOOCs bring efficiency gains in certain areas. Slovenia is a little bit behind on MOOC creation. It's ahead on collaboration, but a little behind on MOOC creation. It's ahead on technology, but not enough MOOCs are being produced. And as usual, the, it's quite often comes down to funding. So if there's funding available, a little funding for MOOCs might not hurt, might be an area for discussion. So that was six slides of ideas. I hope some of them find some context for you, and I'd be very happy to open a discussion. Yes. Does a trusted list exist already, uh, the, the list you were talking about? Um, it is under consideration in many places. Some universities are beginning to use it for ECTS credit. 
So at institutional level, you are beginning to see uh, some trusted lists of MOOCs. So for example, I know that the University of Edinburgh, which is a university I work a lot with, will accept credit from certain others. From, but again, it's usually from like their close friend universities. Okay, how do we know now which university off, offers a very good MOOC? Uh, which one has... You don't. Different... You don't, quite simply. I mean, if you said you want to create a trusted list, you could put together a, a team to check every MOOC and which ones are practical and which one isn't, but that probably wouldn't be very efficient. Probably, and I'm, uh, the better way would say, listen, every time we get a MOOC request for recognition, we're going to check it, and then we're going to consider if we add it to the trusted list or not, and say that this one now is a known entity, this one is not a known entity. Or, for Erasmus, we have a system of Erasmus contracts. How do you know which universities to work with? You have certain collaborations, you formalize the collaborations for purposes of Erasmus. There's no reason you can't use exactly the same mechanisms for MOOCs. As a matter of fact, you probably could use the Erasmus contract itself to cover MOOCs, if you think about it. So there are a few different ways to create trusted lists. And with universities offering ECTS, you do have this issue of it. In some cases, in certain states in Germany, they have formalized and I know this uh, for sure in Baden-Württemberg, they have a law, all ECTS have to be recognized, full stop. If you reject it, if you say we're not going to recognize this MOOC, the user has a right to go to a court to appeal that decision. And I mean, it's a like, legal court, not a university one. So that means they can already that any MOOC that offers ECTS has to be recognized there, unless you can offer a really, 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 really good reason why not? Which is one of the very interesting uh, developments. Uh, there was a question there, I think, or no? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, another question about uh, trusted lists of books. Um, are, are, any, are there any ongoing activities uh, on European level to create such? No, at pan-European level, unfortunately not. The, the, best the best pan initiative at the moment is actually coming from the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, the way cre credit works is you have the American Council of Higher Education, I think I'm saying this right, that, uh, yeah, ACHE, and they basically keep a master list of transfer credits. And you basically apply to them, ask for yours to be in included in the list, and that's basically the official list of credits that can be accepted for uh, transfer credit in the US. There's now MOOCs being added to that list. There's now, let's say, a MOOC section of the list that is growing slowly but surely. And that is, let's say, a pan-US initiative. So the only, let's say, ideas of trusted MOOC lists I know of in Europe really are at institutional level. Would a European one be interesting? Absolutely, but I don't know of any initiatives for it at the moment. Maybe an idea for a project, Darko. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, another question. Uh, this uh, concerns um, uh, mostly to uh, universities, I suppose. Uh, what about the um, other uh, levels of education, for example, in vocational colleges or um, um, Secondary schools, grammar schools. Okay, secondary school, I mean, there's no reason you can't use these types of education in those levels. Qualifications and so on becomes much, much more complicated though. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about higher education is that you have, if you will, a currency of qualifications. You have ECTS in Europe, you have other credit systems elsewhere, which actually lets you trade them, it lets you uh, recognize them, and so on and so forth. For purposes of recognition, it would take a rather large restructuring of the, both the lower vocational sector and of secondary education and so on to be able to do a, sim a similar thing. One of the things that is enabling unbundling in higher education is the fact that a credit system exists. So you can break things down into credits. To have institutions collaborating on joint teaching, I don't see why not. And I think we'll see more examples of this in the future. But uh, the recognition issue, I think it's still 
I would guess at least a decade away before we start talking about it in other contexts outside of higher education. Just to be clear, by higher education, I mean vocational higher education as well. But let's say in lower vocational education that still doesn't have an unbundled system of credits, it becomes a lot more complicated.